Welcome to episode 18 of the Yoga Meets Movement Science podcast. Today's episode is all about pigeon pose. As I'm sure we all know, pigeon is a very common pose in yoga, mm-hmm. and it's one that people tend to really love. They look forward to it, or at least I do, uh, <laughs> usually towards the end of class. Uh, but it's also a pose that has been a bit maligned mm-hmm. in, uh, at least in recent years, but maybe it, that kind of goes back farther than than I know. But People will tell you all about the dangers of pigeon for the hips and the knees. And so there are lots of claims about pigeon, both positive and negative. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So in order to kick things off, Jenny, Mm -hmm. first of all, thank you for joining us today. (laughs) Uh, You're very welcome. I would just like for you to orient us uh, as to what pigeon pose is, uh, I, like I said, we probably know it, but there were some variations mm-hmm. of it that I actually wasn't super familiar with um, prior to preparing for this episode. So if you could just tell us first what the classic pose is and then what some of the other variations are, that would be great. Yes, I can definitely do that. And I just wanted to say, I'll um, interject before I do that. Thank you so much for talking to me about this pose today because you know how like I'm more yoga based and you're, you are a longtime yogi, but you are more like exercise, science, strength and conditioning, fitness side based. So I do realize that I have this experience of seeing um, pigeon pose be quite the contentious pose in the yoga world, at least in the yoga world specifically, like lots of yeah. loving well, and hating. So let, let me ask you, since I didn't know as I was just introducing this, has the has pigeon pose always been maligned dating back to your 20 years of experience in yoga? Or is it a, a newer trend that you're seeing? That's a great question. So as far as my experience goes, it's a newer trend. Like, okay. yeah, like as yeah, I've been in the yoga world quite a while, as you mentioned, and I did not notice um, the criticisms, the the cautions around pigeon start to ri- arise until, I don't know, my experience, I don't know, five, six years ago, but it yeah, everyone's experience could be different. But my observation of the trend is it's more recent. Hmm. Yeah. And I just feel like for you, um, not to make assumptions, but like, I think in the strength and conditioning world, I would imagine you guys would see a pose like pigeon or maybe even do it or have people do something like that. And maybe it's just not a big deal either way. Like maybe there's not this huge love, hate around it in that context. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but in the yoga world, it's just a little different. I don't know. We look at these, these movements and asanas from a different lens and maybe with different, um, values and importance or way yeah. to interpret them. So, yeah, I, I agree. It, uh, on the surface from my strength and conditioning lens, it seems pretty harmless just yeah. to uh, acknowledge harmless my and, bias here. Right. Harmless on that side, but also maybe like, also like, why would people go crazy for it? Like on the other side, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it feels good. So that, mm-hmm. that intuitively makes sense to me, but that I've, I've done it and it, like I said, yeah. I'm 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 pro pigeon. I I'm one of the ones who looks forward to it and ho- you know crosses my fingers that it's going to be in class. Yes, uh, that's awesome. So. Yeah, and since since you revealed your bias, I guess I could reveal mine too. Which which is that I used to be pretty neutral. I didn't. I don't think I really cared either way about pigeon. Okay. Then I became anti pigeon. Oh, <gasps> did you did you not know that? No. Yeah, back when I was in my fa- my um, yeah, this is a while back, but in my earlier phases, um, I'd been doing yoga for a long time. But once I started to learn more about anatomy and quote alignment and um, you know some of these ideas about uh, just alignment being super important to protect the body, and you know I just did these trainings that taught me that stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was through things like that that started to make me become critical of pigeon. I was a fear monger. You were a about pigeon pigeon. hater. I was, and I even wrote some articles. Um, Are yeah, the ar- still- do the articles still exist? Yeah. Are they out in the internet ether? They are, but with disclaimers, because I have this practice of uh, yeah. at least any article that's on my own website, on my blog, if I mm-hmm. subsequently later in time learn more and change my mind, I, 
I try to remember to go back to the original article and I add a, a dated disclaimer at the top that says, oh, wow. you know, I yeah, looked I've seen I've that, learned actually. more. You've seen that? In, in it, one place, at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, I corroborate I just, that you do this. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I remember earlier this year, I sat down one day and I was like, I just, I hadn't done it in a while. And so I was like, I'm just going to do this because it was kind of at the back of my mind phone. It took almost like, oh. most of the day to go through yeah. it. I I, I'm I'm afraid to go back to 2013 on my blog. <laughs> there you go. You might have just you might have said things differently than you would today. I know I did. It, it would be too trauma traumatic. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just have it's to, cool to hear you. Turn the other turn like pretend that it didn't happen. Right. But not. I don't delete the. And you right. know, neither, neither of us do. <clears throat> Another thing to be said about your blog is I think your posts are dated. Like, I think they have the date prominently displayed. That's correct. So if someone stumbles upon one of yours, but they see that it's from seven years ago, they may assume like, oh, well, he might not think. Yeah, your your right. blogs are timeless. That's right. They don't have the date on them, <laughs> right. which is, yeah, yeah, they're timeless. And there are pluses and minuses to that, but... Mm -hmm. One of the, yeah, one of the things is just someone stumbles upon it. They have no idea what year it was written and it could have just been written yesterday for all they know, I guess. So that's kind of why I like to add All of your things. blogs were written yesterday. <laughs> exactly. You had a very, very busy day. Totally. So uh, in any case, I definitely went through a phase where I was anti-pigeon and I thought that it did all this. This is good you know, to know. And, so and you, I, you can role play that side of the argument. Yes, I can. Because I feel like I know it pretty well, at least my experience of what I had learned and what I had parroted from what I had learned. But I have subsequent to that time continue to learn and evolve and will continue to do so. And today, my bias is I, I don't think Pigeon is, um, you know, something to worry is as much about as many of these cautions that are still out there and pretty prevalent that you know they don't really warrant those cautions in my uh, so are you just advice. neutral then at this moment do you mean like on a personal level or just in general for every like how i think May, uh, i guess both one? yeah uh i guess yeah <laughs> i guess you could sum it up as neutral i do like pigeon a lot but like my favorite yoga pose is handstand and so i'm not like you know i'm not like some of those people that just can never not have their pigeon Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I also feel like because so many people do love it a lot, and I feel like that's a high percentage of yogis, they love pigeon pose. I feel like for people, for those people, it probably has this extra layer of good that it does for them if they especially love it. So, I mean, maybe that's less than neutral. I mean, you know, it's more than neutral, at least for that type of population. Got it. Anyway. <laughs> so, right. so we'll, we'll, that we'll context, put you back in... 2017 16 jenny mode for some of this yes we might yes yeah, switch me back <laughs> exactly those are probably the correct year maybe i don't know 2016 2015 anyway let's lay out what pigeon is i believe that most of our listeners are familiar i mean it's a, like you mentioned in your intro it's a very common pose in the yoga world uh, but just in case some people are not familiar with what pigeon is um and there are a few variations but basically it's this pose that I guess, I guess you could call it a, if you're going to classify it, I guess you could say it's a seated pose because you're upright, but you're on the ground. And you've got uh, the, the most classic version is one leg is outstretched straight back behind you so that that hip would technically be in hip, uh, hip extension is like the technical term. And, and if, you're, uh, if your torso is upright, then your spine is also in some extension, especially the lumbar mm. spine, you know, if you're upright. Mm -hmm. And then your front leg, like if you were to think of a forward split, like Hanumanasana, you know, the front in that, that's not pigeon. But if you think of that, the front leg would be straight out in front of you. And it would be, that would be in a position of hip flexion, like the opposite position of the back leg. But in pigeon pose, we don't have that front leg straight. We have that knee bent. And in bending that front knee, and like, it's like you bend the knee and then and the foot pulls in toward you basically. And what that means is that that front hip joint also rotates externally. It's an external rotation. So that's kind of what, what like your classic uh, idea of pigeon is, is it's back leg straight back, front leg in this externally rotated position. It might, and, um, yeah. it, just to con give some context for external rotation, sometimes it's tricky to see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh that that's an externally rotated position so if you were standing and you towed out 
and then oh, your, right. your you know your thigh or femur also towed out in that direction that's external rotation okay. when the knee is bent and the foot goes in sometimes the it seems like oh if my oh. foot is going in you know rotating mm -hmm. in that sometimes makes people think oh it must be an internal rotation but it's actually yeah. it's actually not you have to look at what the uh, or, point. yeah 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 thank you for pointing that out i could totally see how that could be confusing because if you're standing and you turn your toes in that's internal rotation and then in pigeon you see the foot is in yeah exactly so but, I, that's always tripped me up when i was it maybe still trips me up like i <laughs> can't just look at it and immediately you know like oh that's external rotation or internal rotation i have to right. think about it a little bit more i think that's super helpful to to um describe uh, thank you for saying that. So yeah, so that front hip is an external rotation and, um, you've got pigeon where you're just like, say your hands are down on the ground in front of you, or maybe they're up on a couple blocks, or they could even be up on a chair seat, depending. Uh, and your torso could be upright, but I would say in my experience, more commonly practiced is a forward folded version of pigeon where instead of sitting there with an upright torso, you are, your torso is, is hinged forward and you're kind of laying forward over that front pigeon leg. And that's Maybe on your elbows, like Good forearms question. down, or I you can so. all go all the way down too, right? It could be. Yeah. I, I say I'd see either. I see either. What do you, what do you feel like you usually do? Uh, I think or... you, I usually have to work into a deeper, like maybe I start upright then I work down to my elbows and then mm -hmm. over time, maybe I get head to the floor or like mm -hmm. head resting on my folded hands underneath my forehead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you're could you like... do it in a, like with your arms kind of behind you, like a child's pose sort of deal? Or would you usually <laughs> have never those hands? I see it that way. Uh, that's I'm... probably wrong. So you, you would have your, Jenny's duck trying <laughs> it right now. Um, yeah, you could I, do that. But you'd that. usually have your, your, your like a, uh, Usually the arms I, I like straight out in front. Oh, but okay. But you could okay. also like you just did crawl, like stack your hands or stack your forearms yeah. and rest your hand. Or you a, can put a block under your forearms. Yeah. So it's a whatever feels right. Yeah, exactly. Whatever helps you feel supported and comfortable as you hinge forward. Something like that. But that version of pigeon where we're folded forward over the front leg is kind of the classic one that many yoga teachers tend to teach toward the end of class. You know, it's kind of a classic, like cool down or we're, we're done with our active standing poses and now we're transitioning into the cool down. Yeah, it's part. like a, both a signal because people matching people's expectations, it's a signal that the class is ending. Yes. But it's also, it makes sense that we're now moving into the cool down, static mm -hmm. stretching portion, the feel good portion prior That's to right. Shavasana and whatever else, happy baby. Well, mm -hmm. not in that order. <laughs> Your traditional <laughs> uh, cool down sequence. Exactly, exactly. And in my impression, I think that's one reason that people love it so much is it's just like part of that. It's like the uh, uh, this is at least in the context of an a more active, stronger practice. But it kind of signals like we're done with all the effort and the work. Totally. And we get to transition and just rest. And I feel like there's something about that face down position, which really, I guess. Um, once you fold it forward, maybe you could consider a pigeon a prone pose. I said earlier it was a seat, mm -hmm, but it's mm -hmm. seated. But if you're folded forward, maybe it's prone. And in general, like when you're face down like that, for some people that cultivates a sense of just introspection and sitting with yourself, maybe a little more than if you're. Yeah, you know, and also like the the physical aspect of letting all of the work you've done just settle mm -hmm. and kind of like reaping the benefits of that. Yeah, exactly. So some somehow all of this has kind of been layered on and mixed into pigeon in like this special way. I mean, because you could do it just a seated forward fold, which is called Paschimottanasana, mm -hmm. you know, with both legs straight out in front of you and you fold over your legs. Or you could do a wide legged forward fold like Upavishya Konasana. And all of those, if you hinge forward, also have that, you know, face down um, kind of orientation. Uh, so they could cultivate some similar, you know, just mm -hmm. like you're, you're sitting with yourself, you're introspecting, but I feel like they're not experienced the same way for many people as like pigeon. There's something special about pigeon. This is just, Agreed. A yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you've got folded forward pigeon, which, you do which mm -hmm. puts the, so we already mentioned that that front hip is an external rotation. Oh, yeah, when you yeah, fold yeah. forward, you also go into 
hip flexion just Thank to you for mentioning that. round out the, our anatomical description. Exactly. So it's hip flexion with internal rotation or hip flexion with external rotation. Exactly. When you fold forward and pigeon, you're adding more hip flexion to the equation of what's happening in that front hip. And you're kind of reducing, um, potentially reducing some of the hip extension in the back hip. And yep. you're taking the spinal extension out of it. So if this is compared to if you were in an upright torso, you know, you're kind of removing the what what's stretching, you know, the front of the hip and like your belly. Yeah. So you, you pointed out. this out to me before, which I hadn't thought of, which is that in the upright pigeon, maybe the bias is a bit more towards the back hip mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. stretching the hip flexors on the anterior or front side of the back leg. Mm -hmm. Whereas once you've folded forward and you've exited that hip extension and lumbar extension, mm -hmm. now you're biasing more the front leg. I had never thought about it as a, <laughs> a stretch for the back leg. I only thought oh, of it as yeah. a stretch for the front leg, but I, I do see how that could be the mm -hmm. case with right, those different right. variations. Absolutely. It's like you kind of shift where the bias is depending on where your torso is. When you're in the torso upright position, I mean, you've still got that front hip and a lot of external rotation. Yeah. So it's still there. But yeah, once once you add that hip flexion, when you fold forward, that like really seems to turn it up, it seems like. Um, mm -hmm. The torso upright version, I like to, I think of it kind of more along the lines of like a back bend, or you could think of like, high, you know, like high lunge pose, like this is a standing pose now. So high lunge or warrior one or something like that. It's similar in my mind to those because like, let's just say high lunge, your torso is upright and your back leg is straight back behind you. So that hip is an mm -hmm. extension and you've got lumbar extension as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of has overlap there. Which... I also in, in a, especially in a fitness context, mm -hmm. I sometimes see a stretch where you put the front leg in pigeon pose or in pigeon position on like a workout bench. Oh yeah. And that, the totally similarity sad. between high lunge and pigeon there is really oh, tangible yes. because totally. the back leg is kind of doing the same thing and it's just your front foot being on the ground or your front leg being up on that bench. That's such a So the parallel. that's a way to reduce the degree of just have it be a less deep pigeon by having mm -hmm. that front leg elevated on right. a table or bench. Mm -hmm. and, and even in the yoga world, in yoga classes where there are chairs available, mm -hmm. sometimes pigeon is taught a, a variation of pigeon with a pigeon leg up on a chair seat, yeah. which sounds like it's kind of the same. To, as yeah. What yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice. Um, yeah, totally. So really all these variations. And then there's one more we wanted to make sure to mention one more pigeon. I mean, there are more, uh, more than just this, but as far as like that single leg orientation of pigeon, there is the version that is that really is a full back bend, which is where you would start in the upright torso version, but then you would bend your back knee and you would reach your arms up overhead and reach back behind you. This is kind of like King Dancer, which that's like a standing balance pose. It's similar to that. You reach up and back and ultimately your hands catch your foot back there behind you, or you could use a strap or something like that. And um, in Sanskrit, that variation of pigeon is Ekapada Raja Kapotasana, which is one of my very favorite Sanskrit words to say. Sanskrit yoga pose words to say. You did say. a nice job with it. Thank you very much. Ekapada Raja, Can... Kap Ekapada Raja Kapotasana. Echo, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, yes. Uh, thank you for saying I did a good job with that. I had to suck and just guess, like, did I say that right? So anyway, it's a pretty deep back bend, as you could imagine. You know, it's like basically, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of stretch, like through the front. When I looked it up, I, my jaw <laughs> dropped a little. I was impressed. I don't know if I've ever seen that out in the wild, but it's, on, the wild. it's on Google Images for sure. That's You right. can do it. Um. I can't, I don't think I could do that actually. Oh, with I don't think strap. I can. Maybe with a strap. Yeah. Like yeah. I could do King Dancer with a strap, but I don't think I have the flexibility to actually grab my foot with my hands. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a similar, so I said that was called Ekapada Raja Kapatasana. In Ashtanga, there's a pose called uh, Kapatasana, which is super similar to this, except that you're, it's like you start in a kneel, so like both knees down, and then okay. you um, arc back and you reach for both feet. Whoa. And that's super hard too. And I could do that in my Ashtanga days, I could do that. 
Uh, but uh, it's harder when you have that front leg in pigeon and then you're reaching back with just the single on just gotcha. the single. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Before we go forward, the you mentioned in our like uh, preparatory notes for this, that there are mm -hmm. a couple of names for the uh, oh, basic yes. version, yes. I, which I had never heard before. So I just thought that was interesting. That's right. So you mean the, the folded forward pigeon, the one that I feel is the most common in the yoga world where you're hinged forward is also called, well, that can be referred to as just single leg pigeon and also sleeping pigeon, you know? Cause you and like... it's single leg pigeon because why? Like what would double leg pigeon? That's be? a great question. Well, good question. Double leg pigeon, it would be what is often called double pigeon, and it's sometimes called fire log pose. Um, There's some other words for it, but that would be where you're basically sitting and both of your legs are in pigeon and one shin is stacked on top of the other. Have you seen okay. that before? So it's like a cross-legged. It is like a cross-legged, but just a little more. You know, it's like the um, the shins are actually stacked and like <laughs> ultimately it's like uh pigeon leg foot on top of the knee of the bottom leg kind of thing so it's like like this so like that. gotcha something gotcha. like that and that um yeah so that would be like double pigeon so i think that's why it's single leg pigeon is this classic one because only one leg is in a pigeon but you also have other pigeon variations like uh like pigeon chair like you could be in utkatasana or chair pose and bring one foot into pigeon pose there's reclined pigeon on your back mm -hmm, which in a fitness context, we could just call a supine figure four stretch or something. Right. Right. I find that figure four is kind of the term that seems to be used outside of the yoga world. Yeah. For these I guess positions. the the pigeon leg creates the top of the four. And then you kind of yeah. reach through the mm -hmm. opening of the four and pull back on the hamstring of the non-pigeon leg. Yeah, I think you're right. I hadn't really thought about what actually made the four, but that makes sense to me that it would be. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, if you like, if you're just seated and then like seated in staff pose and then you mm -hmm. make your pigeon leg, mm -hmm. then viewed from the top down, that does make a four. Oh, hey, I never thought about that, but absolutely. <laughs> but once you bend the knee, you kind of uh, like of the non pigeon leg, you kind of lose it. Totally. I like how your math mind would just like see that. You're never going. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's actually a variation that you just described staff pose and bring one leg into pigeon. I don't tend to see that as frequent, like as commonly, but that is a variation of pigeon that also could be done. Uh, with like a just... forward fold then? Oh, good question. In or... that case, you probably wouldn't forward fold. You would just, oh, you would right. just like just chill and like push down on the knee maybe. Uh, yeah, the pigeon leg knee, like down, mm -hmm. you mean down toward the ground. Yeah, you could do yes. that. You could also bend the straight leg knee. Ah, like, yes. Foot on the yeah. same. It's almost the same thing as lying on your back then. Exactly. But then you're just like upright. Yeah. Got it. So it's like all these different ways to orient your body around this variation, all these different variations, but it's all with the pigeon leg, which is what that. about 90, 90 position. Oh gosh. I'm glad you're asking is, that. This one that has like the, maybe perhaps the most crossover with fitness. Oh, good. Good point. Yeah. So what, it, what is the 90, 90 position, Travis? <laughs> the 90, 90 position or similar would be a Z sit That's would right. be having the front leg in pigeon in external rotation. Mm -hmm. But then instead of having the back leg trailing, you're going to make a 90 degree angle with that leg too. That's so right. it's like your, 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 your pigeon leg is forward. You have a 90 degree bend at your knee on the front leg. And then the, the back thigh makes a 90 degree angle with the front thigh and the back knee makes 90 degree angle. So it's just all 90, 90, mm -hmm. 90, 90, 90, 90. Yeah. The Z sit is just kind of like a, the thighs are a little closer together instead of having the back leg trailing so much that knee just comes more towards the front foot and maybe the, the, the pigeon knee bends a little bit more to create a that's seat. That's right. Yeah. So it's maybe, it's just, it's not specifically 90, 90, but it's super similar. The Z said. Yeah. 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 So what's, what's and... the, what's the point of this? <laughs> what's the difference? Experience, in my experience. Oh, what's the difference? Um, well, well like why, why choose one versus the other? If they're both hip external rotation positions mm -hmm. on the front leg. Great question. I believe that the 90-90 position takes some of the, um, you know, anterior pelvic tilt out of it. 
So mm-hmm. it just makes it, uh, I guess someone could say maybe more accessible, especially if someone lacks uh, the full uh, external rotation, not the full, but if someone lacks as much external hip rotation in the pigeon leg hip as you might want in order to embody single leg pigeon comfortably, then 90-90 by bending that back knee and scooting it forward, you just kind of take some of that, what's required uh, of that front leg hip out of the equation. Nice. Yeah, I think there's that. Plus, there's just the fact that the 90-90 pose, in my opinion, is super trendy right now. Very popular, very trendy. I myself, I mean, I like it. I teach it. I have it in quite a few of my classes and stuff. But I feel like it's out there quite a bit. I don't know if you've experienced that too. 90-90. Yeah, yeah, I see it everywhere. Yeah, exactly. I, I, like, I like the idea that it's a bit of a gentler mm-hmm. uh, position for the pigeon leg. Uh, I guess the the other thing that we might mention would be that if going into such deep ranges of motion in your classic pigeon pose um, were wasn't so accessible for you, you could uh, one modification besides doing the leg uh, like doing pigeon on a chair or a bench mm-hmm. would mm-hmm. be to put a yoga block or maybe oh, yeah. other. A bolster, bolster uh, yeah. fold the blankets underneath the hip of the pigeon leg. That's right. So elevate your pelvis up a little higher in order to make it more accessible. If yeah. you don't have and, that, and that, that's yeah. not only if the that range of motion is yeah a bit demanding for you. It could also just be a uh, this you know this is a pose that's coming at the end of class when we're trying to relax. Generally speaking, so anything that helps you relax into that pose is a suitable this uh choice and having that block there even if you could do Mm -hmm. even if you could body embody the shape without it if it feels good to have the block there then have the block there absolutely like i personally can uh, pretty comfortably do pigeon fully on the floor but i still prefer to do it with a block underneath my Mm -hmm. my pelvis i just like that like it feels a little more supported and um yeah just like you said it's a little more relaxing for me that Mm -hmm. way so i like that Yeah. Um, And then maybe the last thing before we carry forward is to mm -hmm. briefly touch on the active pigeon variations. Mm -hmm. And and maybe we'll get more into this later or maybe we can talk about it now. But what's the what's the the trend here? Right. So there are all those variations of pigeon that we just mentioned. And in all of those passive they're passive, meaning meaning that the tissues of the hip or the pigeon like hip, they're not really actively working. You're just kind of sitting there. Uh, and there is a trend more, at least, uh, and more recently in my experience is that it's a more recent phenomenon where there's this emphasis on a lot of active pigeon variations in which we're coming into these similar positions and it's they all involve a pigeon leg, but it's you're actively working your muscles. And one, maybe the most straightforward example would just be not going into full hip flexion of the pigeon leg. So you're hovering the hips a bit off the ground, would you say? Yes. So do you mean your your pelvis is a little higher away from the ground and your Mm -hmm. hands maybe are not on the ground so that you're just having to support yourself by pushing your legs into the ground? Yes. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. So that's more of like an uplifted, um, kind of more strength and control based pigeon rather than a super passive. I folded forward. I'm just letting mm-hmm. everything go pigeon. Yeah. Yeah. So that Absolutely. would be like, okay, we're going to work on some strength or strength muscular endurance in this mm-hmm. pigeon shape. Absolutely. And from um, there, you could add active folding mm -hmm. and lifting of the torso right like yeah like hinging your torso forward and up Mm -hmm. over that front leg without your hands down to support you like you're just using that and you could you could do that both in the pelvis lifted or in the pelvis down down for sure with the hinges but maybe the the double whammy of active (laughs) active uh pigeon would be to be off the floor and doing the hinges hinges exactly yeah it'd be more more strengthening for that pigeon leg hip to um yeah to have the hips up and like you and i in our strength for yoga program we have we have some active a couple active pigeon variations that we prescribe especially in our hip openers phase that we had a few months ago that people loved 
And we call we call what you just described pigeon hinges, right? Like you're in that mm-hmm. active kind of uplifted pigeon and then you hinge your torso forward and up. And then we have this awesome one that for all these other active pigeon variations I've known for a long time, this one, you, as far as I know, I invented, invented it. it. We should just it call it you. the pollen pigeon mm-hmm. hinge uh, or the, the pollen pigeon slide. Totally. We didn't call it that. We just called it pigeon slide. That would be but... really funny if we had called it that. Next but time, it's awesome. missed opportunity. And this was pre- way before we ever did strength for yoga. Like you just showed this to me. And um, we both thought it was really cool. So then later when we started Strength for Yoga, we pro- we included it in our program. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to quickly describe what it is? What the Yeah, is? so the, is? Yeah, the, the back foot, I suppose, is on a yoga blanket. And uh, you would start in, uh, I guess, upright pigeon. And then you mm-hmm. would mm-hmm. fold forward and slide the back leg back on the floor. So it's a hinge, but by being able to slide the back foot, you just, you're, I don't know, what does it do? It it allows more like translation of the hips back. Yeah. It, it, it's a, it feels to me like it facilitates the hinge in a nice mm-hmm. way as compared to just having everything in the lower body static and just moving the torso. That's right. Yeah. Is that your experience yeah. of it? That is my experience. Yeah. More movement at the hips and the torso, more smooth controlled movement all the way through the range because you're able to slide the back leg back. And I would just add, I think when I do that one, I have the back foot on the blanket, but also the back knee down on the blanket. Yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. The knee's not lifted, not like a high lunge. It's down, at least yeah. for And you slide yeah. that back as you hinge forward. It's kind of tough. It's hard in a podcast format. This is all, unless someone's watching our video version, this is audio, so it's hard to describe. If we could show it to you, then people would like get it. Um, maybe maybe we could link, link a video a, in the show mm-hmm, notes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or sometimes I think some people might be familiar with like a sliding lunge, like picture high lunge, you know, and like your back foot is on a blanket. You could pull that blanket forward and slide it back. It's kind of like that, but it's a pigeon variation and it's super potent for targeting that front pigeon hip. Like I know um, I told, I felt sore from that for My, a while. And you never get sore. Yeah. I, every time I do either a pigeon hinge or the pigeon slide, my deep hip is so sore Mm -hmm. no matter i could do it every week and uh (laughs) you get a little more sore than i do i feel like yeah different Um, people are different with soreness you know yeah and not that soreness caveat not that soreness is a good benchmark or barometer for a good workout but that's right it it just it in this case it because the hip is in such deep external rotation and Mm -hmm. flexion it and there's load in that position that's what tends to induce the soreness those deep ranges strengthening in those deep ranges right right um so there are other variations like active versions of pigeon and we we could go on listing them all but i think we should probably um start talking about something else about pigeon in this moment but just to give this idea that you've got a lot of passive variations and those have kind of been the mainstay of pigeon for a long time more recently we're bringing getting these active variations kind of brought in um and they're great they're just all great for different reasons Mm -hmm. so speaking of reasons um why what's the point of pigeon pose like why why are we even do i know we've talked a little bit like we've talked about how pe- people tend to love it it's great for cools i mean the passive version of course it's great for cool down uh, but in general like if you want to take a step back and maybe look at like biomechanically on a biomechanical level what's pigeon about like why are we doing it it's a stretch <laughs> It's a a stretch uh, into external rotation and flexion of the front hip, as well as potentially extension of the back hip Mm -hmm. with the torso up. More so So, the torso is up, yeah. yeah. So that's what it's for as far Mm -hmm. as like uh, getting into those shapes. And then you could start thinking about, well, which muscles exactly are being stretched Mm -hmm. uh, if that was something that tickled your fancy to think about. And so, uh, classically, Jenny, what muscle are we thinking we're targeting in pigeon pose? In my experience, classically, it's often claimed that pigeon pose is a stretch for the piriformis muscle. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's, yeah, uh, the piriformis muscle. And that, um, may or may not be accurate. And it also may or may not be the only thing being stretched because as we know, like the, the hip is in flexion. 
Um, so all you would think all the tissues that run along the backside of the hip, like your gluteus maximus and things like that are also being stretched. I find figure four, like as referred to as figure four in the fitness world, I find that's often just called a glute stretch. Mm -hmm. I don't usually see it called like a piriformis stretch tends to just be more like loosely called that. But in the yoga world, and this may or may not be all of our listeners experience, but I've certainly experienced pigeon uh, labeled specifically a stretch for the piriformis. Yeah. So I I think that what you're saying speaks to the idea that you're never, when you perform a stretch, you are rarely, if ever, targeting or isolating Mm -hmm. the stretch to just one muscle. Uh, Maybe you're biasing Mm -hmm. towards that muscle, but muscles tend to be located in close proximity to other muscles and there's often some redundancy. So usually whenever you're stretching something, you're probably also stretching some other things too. But yeah, so I, I, I agree that the, the piriformis is the one in any of these figure four Mm -hmm. or pigeon positions, the one that we're thinking that we're targeting the most. And, And maybe that's true. Uh, the tricky thing, can you, do you know the like origin and insertion of the piriformis off oh, the top yeah, of your head? Oh, yeah, yeah, So okay. the, pir- the piriformis is uh, one of our di- deep six external rotators, or sometimes just collectively called the deep six. And uh, it atta- it runs from the front of your sacrum, which is, you know, that, that uh, triangular bone at the back of the pelvis. So it's attached from there. That's the origin. And then, or the proximal attachment point. And then it inserts over on what's called the greater trochanter of the femur or your thigh bone. So it inserts on like kind of this bony uh, bump toward the outer thigh, toward the top of the thigh. So it runs from the sacrum to the greater trochanter of the thigh. And maybe if you could sort of picture that, if, if you were standing and you were picturing this like this muscle like deep in the butt basically that ran from your sacrum to the thigh, if it were to shorten, you could kind of picture how that might rotate the thigh out externally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. And it's and the, the, it's, these are the deep six because they're deeper than the, the glutes. glutes. Mm-hmm. The glute, so the glutes the... are more superficial or closer to the skin. And then the deep six are closer to the center the of the joint. body. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. They're deeper. That's the deep, the deep six name. And the the other, some of the other deep external rotators are? <laughs> they are um, obturator internus, obturator externus, uh, gemellus superior, gemellus inferior, and quadratus femoris. Those are the yeah. other five to the best. Which five you never hear about. <laughs> no. Right? But you always no. hear about the piriformis. Why is that? For sure. Uh, why is that? It's a good question. Well, um, the piriform is kind of so, so all six of those guys do externally rotate the hip, but the piriform is, is a little different. You know, it's got, so there's this thing about the pure Now we, you, Travis and I have looked into this and we've concluded it does seem a little confusing and a little inconclusive in the scientific literature. And when we consult other knowledgeable people about the body and ultimately in the bigger picture, does it really do questions like these really matter? But there is um there's a claim out there that pure the piriformis muscle it's an external rotator but when the hip is in flexion so when the hip is like when the thigh pulls up closer to your chest then its action switches and it becomes an internal rotator so it does the opposite action yeah and that's pretty important uh let's assume that that's true i I buy it (laughs) i i i'm mentors of mine have explained that and kind of Mm -hmm. demonstrated it and i i believe it to be the case and sort of has to be the case if we're operating on the premise that pigeon pose is a mm-hmm. stretch for the piriformis because, so this is the confusing part. In in standing with the hip extended, the piriformis externally rotates the hip, but to stretch the external rotators, then you would have to go into internal rotation. You That's do right. the opposite joint action to stretch those mm-hmm. muscles. But we're saying that pigeon pose is a position of external rotation. So So how would it on the surface? Yeah, it couldn't stretch the external rotators. It would stretch the internal rotators. That's right. Does it? It does stretch the internal rotators. And it just so happens that when the hip is flexed past 90 degrees, maybe the line of action of the piriformis changes. Mm -hmm. So such that it becomes an internal rotator. Therefore, being in that pigeon hip stretches the piriformis. 
Right. Which would, that would totally make sense. Yes. If the, if the piriformis becomes an internal rotator inflection, then that's why a pigeon, because yeah. otherwise you'd be like, well, how could this stretch an external rotator? Yeah. Cause it is. Yeah. External. And, and you, you yeah. know, you when you do it, you feel the stretch mm-hmm. in the deep hip on the outside and towards the back. Uh, and that that's perhaps glutes like that right. it's difficult to differentiate well oh that's my piriformis stretching versus <laughs> that's my glute stretching uh right. and and as we alluded to before it probably doesn't matter it in reality matter. because you're never isolating one thing and you don't have to and it, you're like you're over you're the the degree to which we need to over specify which muscles we're stretching Mm-hmm. It just might not be that important. It's it's useful to know the anatomy and understand which muscles are where and which positions would stretch which muscles. But as far as oh, we we need to stretch the piriformis, and that yeah. this kind of goes into like the pathologies that have been associated mm-hmm. with piriformis, and then that's right. You know, pigeon being the intervention the or the treatment, treatment. yeah. Yeah. So maybe yeah, we should I, talk about that. Yeah, I, I think that that's actually really for this conversation why it matters that we even bring up the piriformis because I think as you were alluding to, in general, at least when I tend to think about movement and what's being stretched and strengthened, in general, it seems like um, we think about joint actions and movement overall versus getting into the nitty gritty of like which specific muscle because like as you said, we can't isolate anyway and. What really matters more, especially when we're talking about the brain and how the brain connects to all the all the various um, muscle fibers of the body, it's not necessarily like categorized out into these like, um, you know. Yeah, these the 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 anatomy and the like in the textbooks is sort of human fabricated. Yes. like we've we've yes. decided that the this muscle is named this and. <laughs> goes here mm-hmm. and everything and is here. a bit more yeah everything's a bit more intertwined than right. that our our anatomical distinctions make it out to be i think that's right and I, I think it's helpful to have the anatomical names so that we can communicate you know about the body and about various locations in the body but for us to also realize that that's just like a model and there's really the norm is kind of very vari- human variability and we're not yeah. all the same. And also, like you said, inside, it's a lot more interconnected. Yeah, there are other models too, right? Like the anatomy trains kind of oh, line of yeah. thinking where it's looking more at relationships between muscles and across like larger regions as opposed to just mm-hmm. trying to isolate down one muscle at a time. And I think right. that can be relevant in some cases and it maybe is also... Mm-hmm. it. Over complicates things, <laughs> yeah. yeah, in other ways. Like at the the, I don't know that much about it, but the, like you'll often hear about various slings, mm-hmm. like the oblique sling, yes. which I don't, I don't know. Maybe it runs from like one shoulder to the, the opposite, opposite hip, hip. yeah. And then, but also like the the back line, going from what the base of the, the neck f- down to the heels, yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a superficial backline, I think. Yeah. It's just, again, it's, it's like these, uh, it's, someone decided let's link, let's in our mind link these muscles together via fascia and call it this, you know, it's not mm-hmm. that much different. Maybe it's more on a group together level than labeling these individual six. Yeah. Muscles. It's a bigger picture and, and maybe both yeah. have their place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's just a good example of how things can get just like chunked up and categorized and in some ways it's helpful for communication, um, but in other ways maybe can be a little limiting, especially when we're thinking of something more global, like just human movement and like, what's the body doing in pigeon? Well, we're just in hip flexion and external rotation. You know, it, we don't have to get down to the nitty gritty, but we want to for the purposes of this conversation because pigeon pose gets tied into, and some of our listeners may be familiar with these claims that, um, pigeon pose is like the treatment or one of the uh, class of things to do for something called sciatica. Mm-hmm. Right, Robert? Like that's a very, like if you just Google pigeon pose and sciatica, you'll get a ton of, um, you know, articles about that. And a lot of them from like big, like authority publications in the yoga world that are saying like, if you have sciatica, do pigeon. And I personally have like an issue with that because I don't think that we as yoga teachers, you know, are are, are um, qualified to diagnose and treat 
And yeah, plus, it's also an oversimplification. Precisely. Because precisely. sciatica is a very general term that can apply to a few different things with a few different causes. And so mm -hmm. pigeon, it, pigeon pose and stretching the piriformis <laughs> may be useful and relevant for some, some people cases yeah some mm -hmm. cases of sciatica but it's not this cure-all for all cases because the the root cause well even <laughs> labeling a root cause for something as right. complicated as pain is is yeah uh oversimplification but the you know the contributing factor from an anatomical standpoint may or may not be this tightness or whatever yeah, yeah. Um, but the the thinking is like the sciatic nerve which is actually two different nerves right i don't know about i, I think you're right i i hadn't reviewed my sciatic nerve anatomy before <laughs> I think this. the sciatic nerve is the femoral nerve and the something else oh um okay like combine yeah. i know it's a big thing it's like maybe the biggest nerve and it's the thick it's super thick like super yeah thick. and it, it originates like somewhere in the lumbar spine maybe lumbar spine yeah and then That's goes right. all the way down to like the uh, shin foot. or heel yeah yeah and um the point is that it it runs close to the piriformis mm -hmm. or maybe even through the piriformis in some cases in some people I yeah think so so if if your piriformis is tight or quote in air quotes tight whatever, like yeah. what does that mean whatever that means uh that that could put some could. pressure on the sciatic nerve mm -hmm. towards its base and then that could have pain radiate down the leg mm -hmm. that's radiating pain down the leg or in the glute area or anywhere longer down the leg is sciatica right uh so anyway piriformis stretching pigeon pose is the recommended treatment but but as we've mentioned it's that's over overly reductionist yeah yeah overly reductionist and over prescribed as yes. th this will cure your your radiating pain symptoms when uh it may or may not help a hundred percent um and and just to be just to be clear like something like sciatica which which you said is kind of this catch-all term that uh uh that can refer to the sciatic nerve being um you know, compressed or something like up at the level of the lumbar spine, it could be up there, or it could be somewhere around the hip region. And it's more in the cases where the sciatic nerve is like, quote, compressed or quote, entrapped, or like these other words for it, uh, pressure on the sciatic nerve causing the symptoms. It's mm -hmm. in the cases when that's happening around the hip, that that gets tied into talk of piriformis and pigeon pose and things like that. And there is this clinical diagnosis called piriformis syndrome. And that's basically, it's like a type, you, I think we could consider that a type of sciatica in which the idea is that the sciatic nerve is being compressed by the piriformis. But, but uh, current evidence on, on the clinical diagnosis and, and treatment of piriformis syndrome seems to suggest that like the, the evidence-based trends these, day are to, these days are to move away from the term piriformis syndrome because First of all, the piriformis is not the only structure in, around the hip. There's like a bunch of other stuff in there. And if, if the quote issue really is around at the level of the hip, there could be a lot of other structures that could be at play. It's not necessarily just the piriformis, which is actually a pretty small muscle and the sciatic nerve, as we mentioned, is a really big, thick nerve. So, um, so there's that. It's like, it's hard to even know that it really is the piriformis. And then we also have, um, there's this study from 2018 that we can link in the show notes, uh, Bartret et al. And they looked, so they're in about 19% of the population, their actual anatomy of their sciatic nerve is that it does run through the piriformis muscle. And in the rest of the population, it like runs around, but really close to the piriformis muscle. So there had previous to the study, um, there, there had been these claims that if you had that specific anatomical variation of your sciatic nerve, like going through the piriformis, then you were more likely, or you were predisposed to get piriformis syndrome. And so the study actually looked at a high number of subjects. I want to say it was like a, a th roughly a thousand subjects and, um, their sciatic nerve, 
anatomy and whether it passed through the piriformis or not. And then it compared that, it, it correlated that with instances of piriformis syndrome. And it found that, that people with that specific variant of the sciatic nerve traveling through the piriformis, they did not have piriformis syndrome or sciatica associated um, symptoms any more than people who didn't have that anatomic variation. So that's kind of thrown a wrench to into just the idea that a tight piriformis is like what's causing these sciatica-like symptoms anyway. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? So yeah. yeah. So it seems like the, the move is to not even use that term piriformis syndrome anymore anyway. It seems like the preferred term it seems is deep gluteal syndrome. I don't know if you've heard of that, Travis, but that's... No, so that, was like a, that was a new term. one to me, but it, it makes sense. Right? Like, it's like, we don't know. It's not really known what the structure is, but it seems like maybe the pain that whatever's going yeah, on. Yeah, I think that's hip. that's generally the, the move that we're going towards trying less to over-specify and be right. a bit more general. Oh, well, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Are you thinking of some exceptions? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Because then there are other other diagnoses that are like maybe over. Maybe it's the other way. I don't know. Get well, back I think to about it. Come back like, to me. Um, yeah, totally. Like similar to like the shoulder. And you know how there's like a impingement syndrome in the shoulder that has always been like, or this really specific idea of like these specific. Uh, yeah. So that would be another good example. Rotator cuff thing, right? tendon is being impinged at this structure and then you, it's called impingement, but it seems like the move today is not to use that term anymore. And now it's just this general term of rotator cuff related pain or use you know, something like that. Something that just doesn't necessarily name and label this like tiny little structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It seems like that's like the trend with, with a lot of these. So, so similar thing at the hip and when it comes to hip uh, related sciatica, but because that's been a claim for so long that there's this thing called piriformis syndrome and it results from a tight piriformis. And then there's these ideas that pigeon pose stretches the piriformis. That's kind of why those two have gotten married before. Like those two are just like do pigeon if you have this pain. And so I think maybe we're suggesting, you know, like pain is complex everybody's reasons can be a different mix of reasons and contributing factors. And if pigeon pose makes you feel better, like if you do it and you feel better, if you have oh, yeah. symptoms, then that's great. If you do pigeon pose and it doesn't make you feel better, then maybe try something else, but it doesn't have to be this cure all one stretch for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely true. It's not magic. Right. It's not magic. Exactly. And then speaking of magic, so that there were like two, we're not going to actually talk about this other one. Um, But like, as far as claims that really kind of uphold pigeon as being this magical pose, one of them is this idea that it treats sciatica. And we just kind of talked about that. And then the other, which we will not talk about in this episode, we have another episode that talks about it. But I know many of our listeners are familiar with and some people specifically when they found out we were doing an episode on this topic, they were like, please, Make sure to say this in your episode, just for people who maybe didn't hear the other one. But there are these ideas that we store emotions in our hips and that specifically through pigeon pose, like not any other, not any other stretch that stretches the hip, but pigeon and all of the pigeon variations that that somehow releases your emotions from your hips. And uh, so that's just, I feel like another claim, another way that pigeon pose gets kind of held up on this pedestal of just like do it to, you know, cure what ails you so that you release the pent up emotions like a bird flying like out a of your bird. Hips. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, we will refer people to, we'll, we'll even link to it in the show notes, although you can, I think it's episode nine. Yeah. In- Cliff's notes. Uh, that's not what happens in our opinion. Right. Um, emotions yeah, this- aren't stored in your hips and pigeon pose doesn't release the emotions that are not stored there. <laughs> Right. Our brain is, is what about, creates our emotions. Is that about sum up that it's episode? Not, yeah, it does. That's a, that's a perfect summary <laughs> of that episode. Perfect. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's that. <laughs> so second point of like claims made about pigeon that kind of want to uphold pigeon maybe in a more magical way than mm-hmm. is really realistic or yeah. um, science-based. And, and I guess tied into that is that it is a hip opener. Oh, yes. Thank so, you. and that that's... Mm-hmm the the emotions things get gets rolled into that is because it's a hip opener it is opening the hip to release those emotions but we can ignore or we can debunk that contact 
uh, that emotions side of the argument while still discussing the fact that it is a hip opener. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by hip opener is just yes. that it stretches the hip, right? <laughs> um, but yes. but uh, you, you uh, brought this to my attention that like, when you think of hip openers, pigeon, or when one generally thinks of hip openers, pigeon is probably the first one that comes to For mind. Sure. Mm -hmm. Like if you look it up in the dictionary, <laughs> you would see a picture. Because hip of, openers in the dictionary. Right. Yeah. You would just see a picture of a pigeon. <laughs> you, no, you'd see a picture of pigeon, a pigeon pose. pose. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but the, the, which is true, right? It's, it's a nice stretch for, for the hip, all, for the hip into external rotation and, and flexion and, and, flexion and it's stretching all of those tissues or mm -hmm. whatever tissues it is that we've been talking about, <laughs> but it's not the only hip opener no, because Travis. the hip is a ball and socket joint. Yes. that moves in 360 degrees and can be stretched degrees. in any direction. So just like pigeon stretches the hip into external rotation and flexion, mm -hmm. you could stretch the hip into internal rotation. Mm -hmm. You could stretch it into extension mm -hmm. and any combination and also ad adduction, abduction and adduction. adduction. Yeah. Which that's and then, or any side and in. Yeah, and any the combination thereof would yes. also be hip openers. 100%. So we've we've put this pose kind of like single it out and said this is a hip opener, but really any any stretch of the hips, any pose That's that right. stretches the hips could technically be considered a hip opener, right? I totally agree. Which in my mind actually means maybe the majority of our yoga practice could be hip openers because if you think of um so many other poses we don't like we tend to think of like just seated passive stretches maybe as hip openers but what about high lunge as we mentioned before where we're stretching um that's hip extension on that back hip so we're we literally are like stretching or quote opening um the tissues along the front side of that back hip or uh, warrior two which is a side facing wide-legged pose where we've got that back leg out in abduction. So there's mobilization happening there. Eagle pose Garudasana, which is a balance where the legs are intertwined into adduction. So you're stretching the hip. I mean, as long as you're feeling a stretch, as long as you're going far enough to feel a stretch, you could call that a hip opener. Warrior three pose where you're hinged forward. If you're get, if you're going far enough that you get a stretch through the back of the standing hip, that could be a hip. I mean, it could just be a wheel pose, Urdhvidanurasana, full on stretch for the fronts of both hips. So I just, I just think it's interesting, you know, I, I understand that we say hip opener, we think of pigeon pose, but just asking the question of, is that a little limiting for us as far as thinking about what the, the possible effects or benefits could be from the way we move on the yoga mat in general? Mm -hmm. I agree. I'm just real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. Acknowledging the hip opener is like the stereotypically associated pose with, I mean, pigeon pose is a stereotypically associated pose with hip opening. It's certainly not, it's far from the only pose that could do that. Mm -hmm. And we could think a little more broadly about, about targeting the hips when we want to mobilize them. So that's great. That's another claim. That's like a third claim where pigeon pose kind of gets, I guess you could say it gets a little elevated or made a little magical in the sense that we're like, it is the hip opener or pigeon and all of its related poses are all like mm -hmm. the hip openers in yoga. Uh, maybe we could turn our attention now, Travis, to the claims that we tend to hear out there uh, that are on the other side. So rather than elevating pigeon pose, these are the claims that, uh, that, that caution about pigeon pose. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, suggests you can get injured and it's bad for you. Let's talk about those for a bit. Yeah. Too, yeah. So I've heard claims about the knee, mm -hmm. heard claims about Lots the hip. About the knee. Uh, In the pit, the, heard... For the front leg, right? The yeah. Pit. Both for the front leg. Or like only do people fear monger about the back leg in pigeon? That's a great question. I tend to not hear that as much uh, at all. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit out there, but it's more the pigeon leg. Maybe maybe back they back should leg. just to even things out. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> but right for sure, a lot of like pigeon is really risky for that front knee. Pigeon is risky for that front hip joint. It's specifically, people like to talk about the front hip joint capsule. I have found they like talk. That's like this, you know, connective tissue that surrounds the hip joint, all the way down there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I guess maybe I'd ask first, Travis. Do you think 
Based on your knowledge of like biomechanics, your knowledge of um, injury risk and injury prevention, do you feel that pigeon pose is um, especially risky for that front knee? No. Oh. <laughs> okay. No, I, I don't see it. I so I, I guess what the the only reason that I could think mm -hmm. as to why people are so worried about it is because if you look at the pose on the surface, it seems like you need a huge amount of external rotation to mm -hmm. be able to get into pigeon pose, right? Right. And the reality is that people generally on average don't have a huge mm -hmm. amount of external rotation. I think I, I'm just, I'm ballparking this, but I think maybe like 45 degrees I of external rotation. Yeah. Yeah. Would be that. like normal yeah. and maybe people have less than that. So then if you look at pigeon and it's like, we're talking about in order to get the, the hip, like perfectly or like perfectly positioned into the, the shape that we have in our head, it seems like you would need 90 degrees of external rotation. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that, then you have to like steal it, quote unquote, mm -hmm. from somewhere else to mm -hmm. get into that shape. And then people assume that that's just cranking on the knee. Mm -hmm. You're describing it really well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think that that's not what's happening. I think that if you don't have... 90 degrees of hip external rotation, which very few people do, uh, your body just like organizes itself yes. to put you into a shape that resembles it in a mm -hmm. not so risky fashion. Unless you're like doing something crazy um, to try to contort yourself to get into that. But I think like, so where does the motion come from then if it's not coming from the hip and it's not cranking on your knee? Well, it probably comes from your pelvis, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would you're... think, um, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would think it would come from the pelvis in terms of, um, you know, the pelvis may not remain perfectly, quote, square to the front of the mat. It may yeah. rotate away from the pigeon leg a little. And a lot of times people kind of roll onto the outer hip of that front hip. Yeah. Um, or you could elevate if you elevate your hips up, like we already talked about, like on a block or on a bolster, mm -hmm. that is going to reduce some of the external rotation required. Right. So, so yeah, I guess if you're trying to keep your hips super square to the front of the mat and make sure that your hips are not rolling onto the side mm -hmm. of the pigeon leg and make sure that this is another one, right? Your shin is perfectly yes. parallel Thanks to the front yeah. edge of the mat. This was then, another big question. Yeah. Then maybe, just maybe, that pose is going to be too aggressive mm -hmm. into external rotation or external rotation that you're lacking, thereby putting some torque on the knee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that is not, that's like your own fault for <laughs> trying to. For or forcing. Yeah. For forcing yourself into a pose that's supposed to be relaxing. So, like, uh, what are some yeah. of the modifications? All right. We already said. You can elevate the hips with bolster or block. You can not put the shin, try to position the shin parallel, parallel. to the edge. You can go into more knee flexion probably, right? So that means right? you pull the foot back closer to you. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that's just like, maybe that's a, a primary point here is that just because the textbooks say the front shin should be parallel to the edge of the mat or the short edge of the mat doesn't mean that that has to be the case for you. Like mm -hmm. I, so I, I didn't even know that that was a, a specification of the pose until right. very recently. And so yeah. I just always did it with my shin at a, you know, like oblique angle. Yeah. 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 And that, that always felt good to me. And then if I, like, if I try to put my shin to the front edge or parallel, I just can't because I don't have right. that much range of motion. Uh, and then like allowing yourself to rotate onto the, the front hip Outer as hip. needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as opposed to trying to just like squeeze yourself, your your square self into this round peg that is <laughs> the that pigeon pose um, that you see in the textbook definition of hip opener. 100 <laughs> percent i think you put that really well so so like yeah if you really did fit your round body into the square peg of uh front shin uh parallel and like that knee at 90 and your hips on the floor like pelvis not elevated and the hips totally square and you squeezed all of that in i would imagine you'd also probably feel a lot of discomfort in the knee 
So then you would be like pushing yourself past that too. I mean, maybe, maybe that could be enough to like sensitize the knee or create some discomfort. Right. Yeah. So if you feel that back off, <laughs> do, do yeah. one of the modifications that we've suggested, but don't blame the pose for torquing, like hurting your knee or being dangerous for the knee. It's just, well, you haven't done the correct modifications to the pose to make it fit you. A hundred percent. And as, um, as a yoga teacher, who's taught like big groups of people many times, I can report from my experience that whenever I would teach pigeon and everyone would just come into it, if I stood there and looked around the room at all the bodies in the room, everybody would be embodying the pose in a slightly different manner based on the way that their body is like you said, going to self organize themselves into the pose. And they're all going to have just some variation of like their hips are slightly turned to the side or their front foot is, is in closer. So the shin is not, you know, they just like have all these ways. They just naturally, like naturally people don't push themselves into what is super and highly uncomfortable. And I wanted to show you, Travis, I actually have the book light on yoga here. No way. Um, by GKS Iyengar, which considered by many, it's assigned in almost every yoga teacher training. And it's considered kind of like, I, I think it even says, it says on here, the Bible of modern yoga. It's philosophy and practice by the world's foremost teacher. By uh, GKS Iyengar. Not, not to get too uh, off topic here, but mm -hmm. I was under the impression that you had, uh, you've gone through stretches of both having and not mm -hmm. having that book. But now totally you have right. it. And I think I, that speaks to like a, uh, I don't know, like a bigger picture of your, your yoga journey in, what in terms of, well, yeah, you know, so if you took a yoga teacher training and the, the book was prescribed, then you had the book mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. maybe you uh, moved away from the book for a period of time and, you know, tossed it to the side. Didn't need it. Yeah. Donated it burned it. No, right. we're not. Gave it burners. away. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, Never burned a book. But now you have it again. I have it again, Travis. And I looked up, I looked up how Iyengar shows pigeon pose in this book, in the seminal Bible of yoga. And I'm not sure if many people are aware of this because seriously, in pictures of pigeon, you definitely see that front shin at 90. Like, I feel like that's like what most people think of is quote, the full pose. But the way that I'll see if I could try to hold this up to the camera. The way that um, I no. shows you, do you see it? Wow. Can, can you describe what I'm showing you through the camera, what he's doing? What's, what's the BKS front shin doing? BKS does not have his front shin parallel to, he's not on a yoga mat, but if there were a yoga mat. You're right. He's not on a yoga mat in these pictures, but his yeah. front shin's not parallel. His foot is tucked in toward his opposite hip, right? This is so mind blowing. You could say that. I think his shin looks like it's um, at 45 degrees or something like that. It's definitely not at 90. Yeah. That's BKS Iyengar. So, you know, I think that's just something. Like, even he didn't prescribe it to be in all these, like, 90 degrees and straight lines lining up with each other and everything square. Like, even he didn't picture it that way. And yeah. Not that we have to do it exactly the way he does right. it in Light On. But if <laughs> if that were something that you were trying to aspire to, well... You might like in my, I would have assumed because of what people say about having the French in parallel. Well, yeah. he must, that must be how he does it. How BKS does it in light on. Right. It's not. And I, I actually, if I, if I had a guess, I would just guess that's kind of been layered on in the yoga world because we tend to like 90 degree angles and straight lines, you know, as we tend to talk about a lot on the podcast, like these, these arbitrary geometrical um, nice shapes to look at. We like to put that on the human body in yoga practice. I think mm -hmm. maybe that's where the front shin parallel with the front edge of the mat kind of maybe came, but I, I don't think it was in the original or in, if you consider light on yoga to be an origin of pigeon pose. It's mm -hmm. not in there. Um, speaking Myth of the front busted. shin, I know, right? Isn't that awesome? Uh, speaking of the front shin and that front knee at, uh, there is another super common claim, Travis, right, about the um, about that front knee, which is that, and I'm sure our listeners are familiar with this one, which is that you must flex the front foot in order to protect the knee in pigeon mm -hmm. pose. Yeah. So let's talk Do about the to... anatomical uh, uh, truth behind that mm -hmm. claim, mm -hmm. which is that uh, flexing the foot doesn't really have any sort of... <laughs> Uh, effect on the knee. So the only right. way that it could 
is that there's one muscle that crosses both the ankle and the hip or sorry, the ankle and the knee joint, which is the calf muscle or gastrocnemius. Right. So the gastrocnemius flexes the knee and it plantar flexes or points, plantar flexes the ankle or points the toes, Mm -hmm. flexes the knee, bends the knee. So if you wanted to take the leap of faith that um, dorsiflexing the foot would put some tension on the gastrocnemius, which would do something at the knee. I just, I don't know. I I just don't see what effect that has. But you don't see it because gastrocnemius, which is the only lower leg muscle that crosses the knee, it doesn't flex the foot, it points the foot. It does the opposite of the cue, right? Is oh, that- well, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so, well, you're dorsiflexing the, well, what's the point? What, why, are, why are people saying dorsiflex the foot? I think they think that dorsiflexing the foot somehow will activate the muscles around the knee and that that will help, quote, stabilize and protect. The oh, knee. okay. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so if anything, you should be pointing the toes exactly. and plantar That's flexing to, mm-hmm. to uh, activate the gastrocnemius to, because it also crosses the knee and that that might theoretically create some more stabilization through the knee joint, but also yeah it's just not (laughs) right i mean i think that's what it's based on is like the idea is that if you contract muscles around a joint you're quote protecting and we can even question that but then if you bring that down to the cue of like you must flex the foot like the muscles that flex the foot are on the front of the shin they're not the calf muscles it's like your tibia no so the muscles yeah the muscles on the front of the shin don't even cross the knee so they they have no effect on the knee they have no effect on so if you exactly if you flex your foot nothing you know, basically nothing. Maybe something is activating a little upstream or whatever, but it is not. Um, yeah, it's not turning on the muscles that cross the knee, basically. Right. Or not turning so, on, not. so that's a great example to refer back to our podcast from last week, maybe of or maybe an upcoming episode. <laughs> uh, the idea that sure, if you want to flex the foot, oh yes, you could flex the foot, but using the verbiage to protect the knee Mm -hmm. is unnecessary and creates a could create a belief that the knee needs protection Mm -hmm. when it really probably doesn't as long as you're choosing the appropriate version of the pose for you exactly and if you're choosing um maybe not the best not the most appropriate version of the pose for you flexing or not flexing the foot isn't gonna have still not gonna do anything yeah Yeah, like doesn't play a role (laughs) Like maybe, um, so I have a, I have a YouTube video about, it's actually called just flexing the foot, protect the knee and pigeon. I think that's what it's called. We'll link Mm -hmm. to it in the show notes, but in there, I talk about how, you know, maybe if someone had an acute knee injury, you know, like if they like currently have an injury in their knee right now, then maybe like a single leg folded forward over the front leg pigeon, maybe that's not the best choice of a pigeon variation for the maybe. Sure. Sure. Um, and maybe they'd be better with a reclined pigeon or something where they're not like bearing as much load on the leg. Yeah. But that has okay. nothing to, but that has nothing to do with the foot being flexed or not. You know, it's just like, you're changing the entire shape. Um, and, but that just, te- you know, it just tends to get, even when people are on their back, like in reclined pigeon, when there's no weight on the knee, there's still the cue to flex your foot to protect the knee. And, and also in pigeon chair. Any sense. And, Right. It do, but Pete, yeah, the, only, the only way that I could see it would be if you're in single leg pigeon or sleeping pigeon mm-hmm. and maybe there's some rationale for having the toes, uh, you know, more towards the shin, creating a better base to like oh, yeah. support the rest of the body. Mm-hmm. I don't know, just because it's like a little bit more more in than having the toes out. Just, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Such a like we can minute... reach for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's not really. That's not about protecting. It me. just and seems I... like it just seems to be something that people say because other people said it. One hundred. That's what I was actually just about to say a moment ago, which is I think it's a parroted cue that mm-hmm. people learn in yoga teacher training because their teachers taught them, and then they teach it to their students, and it just gets perpetuated. But when do we ever stop and take a step back and just say like, well, actually, why, like, why does flexing the foot protect the knee? And if we just take a moment to examine that, as well as so many of the other 
common cues that we hear in the yoga world. Like when you just take that time to think about it and like uh, examine it on a deeper level, sometimes you find out that actually that cue totally makes sense. Like, yeah, there's a good reason that we should say that. Let's keep saying that. But sometimes it turns out upon investigation that the cue just really isn't supported by what we know about the human body and injury mechanisms and tissue adaptation. And then we're better off just letting go of the cue. And that cue to flex the foot to protect the knee, I, I strongly believe is one of those examples. Yeah. Of like, so what, what should you say instead? Well, do we have to say something instead? Do we have don't, to replace a cue with don't, another Don't cue? say anything at all. <laughs> just let, let people, the people be, have their right? peace in pigeon pose. And maybe this can refer people. So our last episode, Travis, um, was Mike on micromanaging. Stop micromanaging your yoga students. That was our last one, yeah. <laughs> it mm-hmm. was. Um, and that was such a, I, that I feel like this is a perfect example of that. Like um, that cue, don't you think that's a good example of micro? It's unnecessary. It's overcomplicating the movement. Yeah. It's uh, asking for a lot of conscious control, like reorganizing the body, um, d- differing from the way that their nervous system was just naturally putting them in the pose. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. micromanaging. And we Agreed. can just say nothing or say something else, but we don't, you know? Yeah. So I'm glad we about, addressed that. Can talk about the emotions in the hips instead. <laughs> We could. That is a possibility. So, um, so how about the hip? Oh yeah, the hip. So I, I find I hear that fear mongered about, um, for sure, but less so than the knee. I feel like the mm-hmm. knee is seen as more at risk than the hip. It's but not. I... It's not shredding the labrum. <laughs> shredding the labrum is certainly what I hear about pigeon pose. Do the labrum is, um, is a structure in the hip joint, and there's a lot of, at least in my experience, a lot of fear mongering talk about. This is, these are the words. It's like you're fl- in pigeon pose when you're in the folded forward, you're like flopping into pigeon. You know, that, that term, like let's flop, like that has just a negative association. I feel like to just say that, but the idea is that you're flopping your torso forward and that's putting all this weight directly on somehow that's isolating just the hip capsule, even though you just have the hip capsule, just the, just it's all, all the weight's going right into that hip capsule. And nothing else, like not the huge glutes, the big muscles that surround the hip joint, not the the bones, not the ligaments no, of the hip. Not, none of that. No, only the hip joint. Like maybe as we start to say this, like as you said earlier, um, when we start to talk about muscles, like we never t- really target one muscle in isolation. And I don't see how we could really target the hip joint capsule in isolation from ev- all the other structures of the hip when you're doing anything, let alone pigeon pose. Mm-hmm. Um, and aside from that, I think that we know that the hip joint capsule is actually a pretty, uh, pretty tough, resilient structure, you know, that's like uh, designed to withstand load. And it doesn't seem like there's that much load in pigeon pose to begin. It's not like you're landing in pigeon pose. It's not like you. That's not like somebody's dropping you from six feet up, up <laughs> onto not- your mat in, in deep external rotation and flexion. T- totally. And you crash down into that. Yeah. It's just a gentle stretch. It's just a gentle stretch. I'm sure, if somebody like pushes down on you past mm-hmm. your That's a good point, your limit. I don't know. Is that like I haven't really seen that as an assist. I do see. Do um, I do see sometimes there's like hips pushing or spine pushing down in pigeon pose in some yeah. yoga setting. Like as that's long the as that's gentle. Pushing. That's yeah. It's if it's fine. forceful, that's no. That's no good. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like let, let me let me use my leg as the teacher to block your shin as I pull your arms yes. forward. Oh my god! So nothing else can readjust to accommodate. Right, right. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and that is that is not how I ever see an adjustment in pigeon given. But I could see that example. That's a type that that type of adjustment could potentially yeah cause some injury. Mm-hmm. And in some styles of yoga, adjustments can't, there can be a culture around more forceful adjustments than others. That's for sure. So that's certainly something we want to be mindful about. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, it is a deep position of external rotation and flexion. So maybe, maybe some people would enjoy an assist getting deeper into the range, but maybe mm-hmm. for other people, it's enough as they yeah, are. Like where they are is perfect. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Or, you, you know, they could be cued into a deeper position without needing the external force. A hundred percent. I think in many cases, that's certainly true. Maybe in all cases or most cases, but. But hands, hands on is nice and people like that in many instances. So. Absolutely. That's okay too. 
Yeah. And maybe those hands-on are um, less about pushing anyone deeper into a range and maybe it's just more, more about, about relaxing. Yeah, exactly. And that's a whole other discussion that could be had and you know, just about physical touch. And there's, there's a, t- there's a huge, um, what's the word? Can of worms to open. We have we a, to. we have a we whole do. survey and blog post about it that and we then, can link in the show notes. We'll link it in the show notes. Yeah. All about physical touch and you know, it was awesome. And maybe we'll do like a podcast episode on that topic or something. I feel like that could be interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, point being that could be, you know, a mechanism. If someone gets pushed too far, like forcefully, that could be potentially a mechanism for injury in pigeon but that's different than just like your normal body weight pigeon of just you in the pose Mm -hmm. so then maybe the last thing to talk about and then wrapping up is something that we alluded to earlier which when we talked about all of the active variations Mm -hmm. just the idea of the fear-mongering around the passive variations yeah just in general yeah passive stretching but in particular pigeon gets called out for it Mm -hmm. i I seem to see yeah yeah yeah. thanks for bringing that up yeah so i tend to see that for sure that like um pigeon it ranges from either uh pigeon pose is passive pigeon is dangerous and we should only do pigeon if we're going to do it actively like that's the only safe way but then i also hear there's like a range i also just hear it described as passive pigeon Maybe people aren't saying that it's dangerous, but I hear plenty of claims that it's pointless or that it's a waste of time. And it's just like passive pigeon doesn't do anything for you. The only pigeon that has any benefits is to do an active version of it. Yeah. So it's either not doing anything for you or it's wrecking you. Yeah, exactly. It's yes, precisely. Because you're just creating all this uh, unnecessary flexibility. That's right. Without any strength. Totally. Yes. You're, um, you're increasing your passive range of motion beyond your active range of motion. And that's going to predispose you to injury. And this is, this is something we've written about and spoken about before on this podcast. Mm-hmm. The idea that like increasing that gap between passive range of motion and active range of motion is, is, um, what is a correct say? Like deleterious. Is that, is that a sure. correct word there? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, that it's deleterious for the body that you're creating more range of motion that you can't control. And the only ranges that are safe for you are the ranges you can control. I don't really feel like we have time too much in this, in this conversation. This well, we really bust that. Yeah. But it's not Check true. Check out a blog we'll, post on that. Exactly. We'll link in the show. And our um, stretching myths and stretching facts conversation, our podcast episode with Greg Lehman, which is episode five. We talked specifically about that a few times in that conversation. And Greg did a really good job, I thought, of really questioning those, those common claims. And I'll suggest that that idea of it, when we increase the gap between AROM and PROM, active and passive range of motion, these claims about it, I also feel that they've arisen around the same time that like the 90-90 position has become really popular in the yoga world and around the same time that active variations of pigeon have become so popular. It's all kind of, in, in my experience, kind of lumped together as this one kind of mm-hmm. movement within the yoga slash movement and in the fitness worlds in general. So anyway, yeah. So uh, I think, Travis, that we would suggest that um, passive pigeon can have benefits, as we mentioned. For all a, the reasons we like. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, it as feels much as good. Any, it People feels good. People like it. it. It's a good in, cool down. It may increase some flexibility. It will. It, I think it it's will. It's a nice I mean, cool down. People, it meets people's expectations if that's what they're looking for at the end of their practice. Precisely. And that it could be all that you need. 100%. <laughs> and then if we kind of can put to rest the idea that static stretching without co or um, without strengthening at the same time is a bad thing, mm-hmm. um, then yes. there's just no, no reason to fear monger about it or, or think 100%. that it's going to have any sort of deleterious effect. Or to even it's think. just. As Greg would say, as Greg Lehman would say, it's just vanilla. It's just vanilla. Exa- exactly. Um, maybe, as- m- yeah, maybe that's the premise of this pigeon pose. It's just vanilla. Oh, we could have started with that. That would have been, that, that was our theme in the stretching, in that episode five. It was a really good theme. That stretching is vanilla. Pigeon pose is vanilla. You're so right. Um, but yeah, I think as much as people like to say that passive pigeon doesn't do anything for you, I think that's very, that's inaccurate because we know from tons of research that passive stretching 
does increase range of motion. Like I hear this claim a lot in the yoga world that if you're stretching passively, that won't make you more flexible, but it will. And if you do pigeon pose, you're mobilizing that hip and it will. I mean, if you do it, you know, often enough and with the right volume and blah, 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 it certainly will. Um, The one thing passive pigeon doesn't do is sure, it won't strengthen you in that position, but it's not supposed to. Like passive stretches, they're not there to strengthen him. That's what strengthening yeah. is for. We can yeah. strengthen so, the pigeon, but that's something. So different. I guess what, what people would say would be, well, you can get into that motion, but then you should always be creating some sort of contraction either on the front side or back side, pulling yourself into it or pushing yourself out of it, which is fine to do. if you want to do that. But also the way that people typically treat pigeon is as more of a ra- relaxing cool down. So maybe, maybe there's a case for doing those sort of, th- like those would be other active variations apart from the active variations that we already mentioned that maybe they look exactly like pigeon and you can't even necessarily see that someone mm-hmm. is putting effort into mm-hmm. pulling or pushing in that position, but it's an option, but it's not, it a doesn't necessity. have to be. Yeah. Totally. Just, it's like one it. way you could do the pose. But it's not the only way you have to do the pose or yes. bad things happen, right? They're all just options. And yeah, pigeon itself is pretty um, pretty vanilla. And if you love it, I feel like if someone loves it, it's actually more than vanilla for them, you know? Because it's like- I, I agree with that and, too, yeah. It's actually right. more than vanilla. It's like, what's the, what's the ice cream flavor where they're twisted together? Vanilla and chocolate? You know Rocky, the one. Rocky Road? No, no, like the soft serve where the vanilla and the chocolate are all twisted together. Or maybe there's strawberry in there too. I can you picture know, it. You I, know what I, I'm saying. I there's a name what, for it. I can picture it, but I have no... Oh. It's like when they're, blend, when they're mixed and you see the two stripes, like they're... Yes, different. yes, that's what pigeon is. <laughs> so it's vanilla with chocolate swirled in or whatever. It's like a mix of chocolate and vanilla and maybe strawberry too. <laughs> maybe strawberry too, yeah. This. That's amazing. I think that's a that's a great note to end on. So pigeon could be vanilla, or it could even be vanilla plus chocolate plus strawberry all swirled together. Depending, maybe depending on the person, depending on the context, depending on your reason for doing the pose. Um, it's really not. It's not a not a big deal, right? No one has not to do it. Deal. That's the other thing. We're also not here to say everyone needs to do pigeon. Not at all. Mm-hmm. But if people want to do it, if they love it, um, we don't need to be. We don't need to fear monger about it. Agreed. So if we ask pigeon pose friend or foe, which one is it? It's friend to me. <laughs> me too. Me too. Yeah. I think in most cases it's, it's friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I think with that, we've probably done a good job of like pretty thoroughly targeting this topic of pigeon pose. Yeah. And, and all the claims we tend to hear about it and the anatomy and biomechanics behind it. So I hope that um, our listeners find this conversation like um, maybe somewhat eye-opening and interesting to just maybe give some new ways of thinking about this classic common pose, um, new ways that we might approach it and um, consider it. I hope so. And I think so. <laughs> Same and maybe here. the next time they do it, uh, mm-hmm. they can do it with uh, uh, eased conscience. Yeah, exactly. Maybe a little less fear around it. Like we don't need to have so much, yeah, fear there. Well, thank you so much for talking to me about uh, this uh, this topic, which really there's there's a lot to go into for pigeon pose. But thanks for being here with me to talk about it today. Thanks, Jenny.